health institutions like Riverview Hospital. Those of you that were former nurses that worked at Riverview here know its value and you know we need it. We need Riverview for everyone, not just the developers to make money by paving and building but for all to enjoy and have a breath of fresh air from the beautiful trees. I always say the pandemic taught us one thing above all else. We need green spaces to heal, to have the space. There is nothing like the beauty of nature. We used to try and go to uh, colony farms to walk. We couldn't get in during the pandemic. We need Riverview. We have been supported by some wonderful politicians who are longtime supporters of RHCS and are here today. We want to thank Bonita Zarillo, Finn Donnelly, Richard Stewart, Matt Dijonlin, Steve Kim, and Jennifer Blazowitz. Did I miss anyone? Is there any other? Um, <laughs> Laura, I <laughs> think. Um, uh, yes, of course, was on our board for many years. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn, for those introductory words and give us a little bit about the spirit and um, all that has been accomplished and why it's so important to protect this much while the Riverview lands. Now, we're going to have a few words from some of our elected representatives. And I'm going to ask Benita Zerillo um, to come down. Thank you so much for the invite today. Um, I just wanted to say it's so great to be here in person. I've missed seeing so many of you over these past three, three, three years. It's hard to believe that we are going to be in the three years of uh, this COVID. But so lovely to see you today. And I just want to say I'm Anita Zarilla, the Member of Parliament for Port Beauty, Coquitlam, Adler, and Belpera. And today we are meeting, as you said, uh, Marilyn on Nancy, on the Nancy and traditional territory of the Coquitlam, who have been stewarding this land since time immemorial. I just wanted to raise my hands to the Coquitlam people that have been nurturing this land. And as Marilyn said, it's such a, such a meaningful um, area for all of us to have benefited. Yes, there's been a lot of pain around the Riverview lands, but also a lot of pain. So I'd like to take a moment to thank the Riverview for Cultural Center Society for loving this place and for nurturing the beauty of it. These lands, as I said, have had pain, yes, but have also provided a place for sanctuary, education, arts, and recreation. And I'm grateful to be here to celebrate the immense contributions of RHCS for the last 30 years. And cheers to many, many more years as recreation and love come together on Sumi Plaza. Thank you so much, and I have a good for you. Thank you so much. Marilyn, I have a certificate for you. But I also have a platinum pin for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. So I wanted to leave that with you. And I also have a few more here for all of your executive, as well as a couple to give away today. I know we're doing some prizes today. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you mind if we do a photo? Columbia, David Eby, 
and my MLA colleagues, Selena Robinson, uh, Mike Farnworth, and Rick Blumack. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today to congratulate the Riverview Horticulture Center Society on 30 years. That's pretty amazing. So I think you should give yourself a great Quite, quite an accomplishment for the Horn Society. Uh, it's uh, one of the longest serving and most active uh, advocacy uh, groups in the Tri-Cities. Thousands of people from the Tri-Cities, uh, the Lower Mainland, other parts of British Columbia, uh, Canada, and indeed around the world have uh, enjoyed one of your guided tree tours uh, of the magnificent trees of Samikwiyama. So the members and supporters of the Hort Society have spent the past 30 years educating the public about the unique tree specimens, many of which were planted on the campus over 100 years ago. You've done this by organizing tree tours and tree festivals, by participating in many community events, and by speaking at schools and directly to community groups. And you've reached out to political leaders, and to the media regularly over the past 30 years. So all this work has helped uh, to ensure that many British Columbians are aware of the treasure trove of trees that has been protected on the Samikwiyala lands. We all know that trees bring natural elements and wildlife habitats into the urban surroundings, which increases the quality of life of local residents. We like trees around us because they make things more pleasant. We feel serene, peaceful, and restful in a grove of trees. We feel at home with trees around us. Thank you to the Hort Society board, members, volunteers, and supporters, of, of many of which are here today. So thank you to all the work that you have done. years of work to preserve the magnificent collection of trees at Simiquiela has greatly enriched our community. And so uh, along with uh, Benita's presentation, I also would like to ask Marilyn to come forward and I have a little presentation to make uh, to Marilyn on behalf of the society. Back to Thanks.
value of the trees that syner are so synergistic to the healing place that we call Riverview. Um, uh, I, I cycle through, I should apologize, I'm not in a suit today, but I'm on my bike, and I cycle through the Riverview site every, every few days, and, I'll, and I get to do it again this afternoon, partly because of what it does to me. Um, I know when our daughter, uh, a decade ago, was diagnosed with mental illness, uh, and the Riverview site, and oddly enough, uh, Raft River Beach in Parksville, the two places that Vanessa um, re rebooted, she could go there and find solace at Riverview, and she could sit under those trees and see such magnificence. And uh, she was quite public with her mental health struggles, but um, and, and but she also got to experience what a hundred years of mental uh, health and mental Ill, mentally ill patients got to experience on, the, on this site. Um, so we saw it as, as parents. And when these photos are flipping through here, I recognize the Bell Horse chestnut that Vanessa has, has sat under for hours at a time. Um, uh, just after the, the 215 graves were located in Cabins, I sat down with the chief at, at Hall at the Riverview site for it was going to be a half an hour and about three hours uh, in Penny's Garden, talking about his history there. He worked there at one point, and he understands to some degree the, the, the community's aspirations, the community's the way the community cherishes that site. And um, when we get to the uh, Gillespie's uh, ceremony, I'm, I'm standing there with Vanessa's therapy dog. Um, Vanessa takes that therapy dog today to her work. She's now a psychiatric nurse. One of her jobs is working at Riverview in the rehab program with Coast Mental Health. And that, that special dog and the value that the site, the dog, that so many things that we can bring to those who have mental illness and addictions. And, and this site, you don't have to be living there to experience the special realities. I've talked too long, but I thank you very much for everything you have done as an organization for the Tree Fest, for the, uh, making us understand what is at stake, making the new council members and the community understand what is at stake with, with Santa Clara and uh, a, a remarkable 240 acres that we all need to cherish. Yeah, Council. Thank you so much, and thank you to my colleagues, uh, Steve Kim, I see you, Neil Neil Nicholson, former colleague, uh, Matt Majonic, uh, and, and and others who are also former colleagues and have spoken. Thank you. In fact, yeah, this whole group over here was. <laughs> and I won't even mention candidate Sue up there. It's <laughs> almost going to City Council. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, um, and also thank you for reminding us the importance of these trees play not only in our physical health and not only as things of great beauty, but also in our mental well-being. So it's something we, I think, always have to remember that these trees play so many important roles in all of our lives here. Um, next, I would like to invite Terry Medeski up, and Terry's going to share with us uh, some thoughts and reflections over the years of um, RHCS, and Terry's the past president of this group, and she's the long-serving, still active member, so she holds a lot of the history and, and the memories in her, in her own heart. My first experience seeing the site was picking up my sister who worked at the hospital and it left me wanting more. So when I saw an ad for the first guided tree tour, I went with my mother. The two tours were presented by Bill Brown and CBC Canadian gardener David Tarrant during the Mental Health Week, May 1992. Bill was our founding member and first president. Bill worked for the Vancouver Parks as their manager of 
of horror culture and horror culture. Bill was retiring, and in Bill's little tree farm, he collected unique seeds. He specialized in uncommon tree types, not readily available for the most seeds. He toured Riverview in Cocoa, looking for ornamental tree seeds. I remember him telling us how shocked he was to find this collection of trees, particularly in his own backyard. Uh, there were plans at that time to downsize the hospital, so he connected with a group of Riverview retired nurses, current employees, volunteer center staff, and along with his tree knowledge, they wanted the area preserved. Bill was RHC as president for the first three, three years. We've had many different presidents over the years, Norman Gillespie being the longest standing. Uh, since our first tours offered, the group has reached thousands of members of the public. Tour guides were society members and volunteers from Coquitlam Parks and leisure staff in the beginning. More recently, they're volunteer arborists, culturalists, etc. horticulturists. Early members also gave tours to many special interest groups, some from as far away as Japan. These groups have included large groups of students, families, and tour guides, and master gardeners. Many of the knowledgeable visitors were overwhelmed by the mature beauty and variety of trees. I became a board member in those early years when the hospital was encouraging our group to come onto the site at that time. The thinking, I believe, was that the public integration was healthy for the parent patients. In fact, I just recently found a newsletter right up from Norma Gillespie in 1994, and she wrote, the patients at Riverview seem to be quite comfortable with groups touring the hospital grounds and will very often join us. This has been a very positive thing, the exchange between community individuals and sometimes long time residents has been quite often very moving. Perhaps someday the stigma attached to mental illness will disappear altogether. So one of the group's biggest achievements was our book, The Review Lands, Western Canada's First Botanical Garden, launched in June 1994. The book was published with the help of a grant from Environment Canada it offered an in-depth information about the history, the ecology of the trees. Besides that information component, the book served to raise awareness as it was distributed to libraries, schools, colleges, etc., as well as being offered for sale and raising funds for the society. It contained many colored historical and black and white photographs, as well as the original artwork of Brenda Gill Gillespie and Sue Cowan. Over the years, Brenda has also done our logos for the group and for our Tree Fest logo. She's been uh, just awesome. Burke Mountain Naturalists were an early ally, offering us publicity in their newsletter and generating the interest of the Federation of BC Naturalists, who passed a resolution in favor of preserving the Riverview lands. The Society's advocacy also led to an informal formal alliance with the BC Schizophrenia Society who wish to have the lands preserved in perpetuity for the benefit of mentally ill people in BC. In collaboration with BCSS, the groups assembled a petition addressed to the provincial government with some 22,000 names demanding the preservation of the new lands. Individual supporters included David Tarrant, Brian Minton, and David Suzuki. Uh, and now, uh, another one of our achievements. The first Festival of Trees was October 30th, 1994. I call it that because that's what the original name was until we had to change it. It's now called what well, became Tree Fest. The annual uh, Tree Fest became one of the largest achievements for our society and became the most visible awareness event. In 2018, we celebrated 25 years of Tree Fest with t-shirts and cake, and that became our last one to date. 
uh, edge of here that we're hoping to revive. So, not totally sad news. So, the, the City of Coquitlam staff made kind support was invaluable over the years. We had changing city reps, but the longest was Kara Self, and we don't see her. She put her hand up, there she is. Uh, our activities have been focused on making people aware of the lands and opening up the lands to the public. That was our mandate from when the hospital was going and BC, BC was here. That's changed a bit over the years. So uh, because of our advocacy, the provincial reps, the BC Building Corp, uh, undertook a formal tree inventory process which identified some 1,800 significant and important trees on the site and created the database of this information. Number of tags were also placed on these trees. So I believe if our group hadn't intervened at that time, I think that was another really great accomplishment of the group. Oh, after 30 years, I'm pleased to see this interest still in the group, in the trees, and I'm also more pleased to see the new board working and carrying on the work that has been started in 1992. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. I know you went to a lot of work to put together some really thoughtful um, memories and reflections on, on RHCS, so appreciate the work you did there. Um, now, next up we have our keynote speaker, and presenter Douglas Justice. And Douglas is the Associate Director of Horticulture and Collections at UBC uh, Botanical Garden. And Douglas also co-authored the Jade Garden, so new and notable plants from Asia with UBC Botanical Garden colleagues, wrote a field guide to ornamental cherries in Vancouver with volunteers from the Vancouver Cherry Blossom Festival, and recently co-authored the book, The Lives of Leaves, with Dan Crowley, and that's going on the Christmas list. Um, so Douglas also wrote the text for the mobile app, Vancouver Trees, and I believe there are some trees from Smithwell and Riverview on that app, so definitely worth checking that out. And is now working to complete a similar volume on uh, describing cultivated shrubs in Vancouver. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Douglas Justice. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's nice to see people here in person. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, speaking to you about uh, Riverview, about, um, about the place, um, about the trees, uh, and I do want to acknowledge um, not just the Coquitlam First Nation, um, but also the people, all the people who have come before us who have been um, residents at Riverview, staff, um, and um, people, all the people who've had access to the site. Uh, and that goes way back. Uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, jump in here. Uh, so I have a few questions. The first is why, why actually is there a tree collection at Riverview? And I think most of you probably know the answer to this. Uh, there's a tree collection at Riverview because a couple of things came together. One was um, the, the provincial government wanted to uh, build an arboretum at Essendale, uh, and secondly, um, they also wanted to build a psychiatric hospital uh, at Essendale, and the, the two uh, seemed to, uh, to come together. Um, the second question is how old are the trees, and um, people have already uh, answered that to some degree. Um, but the third and probably the most important uh, question they want to answer is, is this collection unique? And so I'm just um, I'm going to start with John Davidson. Uh, this is actually a slide um, that 
that was um, produced. It was a photograph taken by John Davidson. He set, he set up the camera. He was um, an amateur photographer back in the days. This would have been about 19, um, uh, 1908 or so. And um, uh, this is in his garden in Aberdeen in Scotland before he was hired by the provincial government to come to BC. Uh, and it's, um, it's colored, it was hand tinted. Uh, we have at the Botanical Garden, we have a collection of John Davidson's lantern slides. And um, John Davidson was a fascinating individual, um, and not least a fantastic photographer. Uh, and um, the problem, of course, with lantern slides is that you need um, a particular kind of projector and the slides themselves are mounted in glass and so they weigh an awful lot. And so a collection of lantern slides uh, is not an insignificant thing. But anyway, uh, John Davidson came to BC and he was appointed the provincial botanist, but more importantly, he established the Essendale Botanic Garden in 1912. Uh, and the, you know, speaking about trees, um, John Davidson as a botanist understood, uh, and I think we all do understand that trees suggest permanence. So Riverview is an open treed landscape and in many ways an open treed landscape suggests um, a refuge. Uh, and this is the idea that, um, that was born in the last part of the, the uh, 19th century around uh, psych psychiatric care. Um, psychiatric hospitals um, across uh, the Western world um, were, um, were seen as places where uh, if, if there were trees and there was open space, then people would find that a healing environment. Um, at ar around the same time, John Muir was around, and uh, John Muir, who some of you might know, was the kind of prophet naturalist who... Um, who lived part of his life in California, he said everybody needs beauty, places um, where nature may heal and cheer and give strength to the body and soul alike. Um, and if you look at what the picture of West Lawn here, you can see that it's not very, uh, not very treed in 1914. Uh, and, and I think it, it was obvious John David's John Davidson saw it as an obvious place uh, to, um, to plant trees. Uh, and so, uh, for example, some of the trees that, that he planted uh, were the silver maples that are along, uh, along the bottom um, near the parking lot uh, paralleling Lougheed Highway. And those silver maples are um, starting to show their age, or they've been showing their age for some time now, but um, if any of you, um, you know, want to see magnificent trees, uh, that's a, a good place to start. Those are really, um, uh, those that are left uh, are, uh, are magnificent in their, um, you know, their sort of stretching out. Uh, and that's something about the Riverview site that, that's somewhat unique uh, in that there's enough space for trees. Uh, and this is not something that we see a lot of. Uh, that is, um, you know, when we see now municipal parks and gardens, there's not a lot of space. It's, it's rare to find enough space to grow a, a deciduous tree to, uh, so that it can uh, express its full potential, for example. Um, this is Acer Cappadocicum. The Colosseum maple is another, um, probably somewhere around 100 years old. And this is not a very common tree. Um, it probably deserves to be a more common tree. But um, the Colosseum maple is, uh, is a relative of the, um, of the Norway maple. And uh, again, Norway maple has been um, it basically taken off of um, uh, lists of uh, trees to plant because uh, of its invasive potential. Uh, and this is a really uh, a fantastic tree, uh, the Colosseum maple. It doesn't show any of those invasive tendencies uh, and ends up being um, 
significantly smaller, uh, although it, um, it has some of the same sort of positive attributes that the Norway maple has. Um, I have to say one of my favorite trees on, uh, on the Riverview site, pro probably my favorite pair of trees on the Riverview site, uh, are the silver lindens. And, and I think anybody who's uh, familiar with the site will know these trees. Uh, and to stand under those trees uh, and look up into the, the, um, the white-backed leaves and the, the light-colored trunk uh, is, is really a revelation um, to see just how magnificent uh, a tree can be that's allowed to, to grow and express its, uh, its true nature. And, and again, you know, if you walk up that little hill and you uh, park yourself under those trees, uh, you look at that and you think, you know, this is a tree that I had not, you know, I have not experienced anywhere else. Uh, and, and that's true, there aren't very many silver lindens that are planted in the, uh, in the lower mainland. There are a few, but really I've not seen any that are planted on um, soil that's as deep uh, as at Riverview, and that's what's allowed this tree to become um, uh, as big and as beautiful as it is. Uh, and that's, that's something that people, uh, I don't know, you know, tree people sort of figure this stuff out pretty quickly uh, about how, how plants grow and, and where they, you know, where they thrive. Um, other people who are sort of moderately interested or, or maybe just um, uh, casual visitors, they see trees sort of as wallpaper. Um, you know, it's nice wallpaper, but it's, but it's still wallpaper. They don't really understand what's happening under the, under the ground. They don't really understand, um, you know, how uh, the amount of water, you know, that, that uh, feeds the roots, uh, you know, how that makes a difference. To, um, to the health and to the longevity of trees. People don't understand uh, how space uh, and, the, um, uh, and how, you know, not having, uh, you know, uh, traffic, um, you know, running over the roots of trees or, 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 um, or just having roots um, uh, in, in a small space, you know, how that, that affects trees. And, the, the thing about Riverview and the thing that I always tell people uh, when I do walks at Riverview or when I'm talking about the site is that the site is unique uh, in that it's one of the few places where the soil is deep and well-drained and where there's water at depth. And that makes an enormous difference in a climate that's dry in the summer and wet in the winter. Uh, we don't have to do anything to, uh, to grow big trees at Riverview. We basically just have to plant them. And you can see from some of these older trees, uh, this is a, another lovely tree. Uh, sadly, uh, um, it's had some damage, the golden elm. But these trees, uh, I suspect, were never watered uh, much uh, in their youth. Uh, and and they, they established and now uh, they grow and, um, and they're doing well. Those, those big trees on the site, uh, they don't need irrigation like, like the trees do in parks. Everybody's seen the little green gator bags around trees all over, uh, all over the lower mainland. The, that's, you know, that's two things. One, that's, uh, you know, that's climate change, but it's also that the soil is never quite as deep or as fertile or as moist at depth as it is on the Riverview site. And so that's a really um, fundamental difference between Riverview and, um, and other sites. Uh, that's a beautiful elm. This is not my picture, but a beautiful elm. There are a number of elms on the, uh, on the site, some of which are in the 90-year-old range. And, you know, elms are trees that when, when you see them uh, at 40 or 50 years, 
um, they're not very interesting trees. And it's only when, when trees like this get to be 80 or 90 or 100 years old that they really start to, uh, to look um, you know, as beautiful as, as these ones do. And I can, you know, I'm hopeful that, that many of these trees are, stick around for another 100 years uh, because many of them are capable of living to, to that age. Um, again, uh, lots and lots of, of trees, this beautiful grove of uh, blue atlas cedars, uh, red oak, uh, those beautiful red oaks. Uh, these are the largest red oaks um, in probably in Western Canada. They're as big as the ones at the Agassiz Research Station. That's another uh, really amazing tree collection if, if people are interested uh, in seeing those. But, um, really a fantastic trees and they just stand out in the landscape. They have the space to really express themselves and um, uh, this is so rare. Even the Lombardi poplar, which is a tree that you can't, you know, cities are not even allowed to plant these anymore because of the risk of breakage. Well, here, the Lombardi poplars, well, they might lose a branch or two every once in a while, but they're much healthier on this site than they appear to be in other sites. And that lack of stress means that for trees that are normally in the urban context, um, you know, not a good choice, these uh, do very, very well here. Uh, and so um, everybody I think knows Lombardy poplar and they probably all know, uh, you know, lousy looking Lombardy poplars in the urban situation. Oh, here's a, here's a tree. This, um, I, lo I love to talk about Metasequoia glyptostraboides, which is known as the Dawn Redwood. And I suspect this is, um, I don't have a planting date for this tree. I think it's probably, it looks to me like it's about 65 or 70 years old. Uh, it might be a little bit older than that. Um, but it has a fascinating history of discovery and uh, being spread around the world. Um, but one of the things that, that I always think about when I see this tree uh, is not only that it's a fantastic tree, um, but that the area around the base has been terribly neglected. Uh, and you see blackberry there and you see all kinds of other uh, plants growing up. And it reminds me that the site has not been well looked after. I think, um, you know, I don't think this is a controversial statement uh, in a group like this, but I think that, you know, when I first came to Riverview uh, back in the 90s, I was um, bringing classes out and uh, wandering the site and looking at trees, uh, and things were not pristine, but they were much better cared for than they have been. Uh, and I think this is a serious problem uh, and one that, um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, there are some very, very valuable trees on the site. Um, and many of those trees people might not recognize as valuable. This is a, um, a flowering cherry, um, not, a, not an exceptionally rare species, but a relatively rare species. Um, and one that's dying out all over uh, Vancouver and in Richmond, uh, the, where those are the only other places that I know this tree exists. Uh, and here at Riverview, um, much healthier. Now, why is that? Um, is that just the, the absence of um, you know, sort of atmospheric pollution or crowding or you know, too many people around stomping on the roots? or something like that, I don't know. But um, anyway, this is, um, uh, this, when I first saw this tree, it didn't have flowers on it, and so I just assumed that it was one of the more common flowering cherries, and then when I finally saw it in flower, I realized that this is actually a rare plant and um, uh, exquisite blooms. Uh, speaking of exquisite blooms, everybody knows this plant, everybody takes pictures of this magnolia when it's out, and this is, um, 
um, uh, a hybrid magnolia, Magnolia sulangiana. It was very popular in the early part of the 20th century, uh, and it was probably imported uh, I think, if, it, if not John Davidson, then whoever followed John Davidson uh, probably imported it from, uh, from Europe and planted it, uh, Lenii alba. This is a, a, a plant that's very, very hard to find now, um, and um, it's totally worth growing, but you need space. And that's, again, I come back to that. Riverview is one of the few places where you can see these kinds of plants express themselves. And you know, who, who can't fall in love with that? I mean, that's just a really an outstanding, uh, outstanding tree. Uh, some other rare plants. This is um, uh, a hawthorn. This is um, an unusual hawthorn. There are really only a few uh, of these hawthorns in the lower mainland. Uh, there are a couple in New Westminster and a, a couple on the Riverview site. Uh, Prunifolia is, is its name. And again, uh, I don't know where these came from. I'm going to guess that they're probably 60 years in the ground. But they're stunning plants. They're absolutely um, uh, first-rate plants. Now, say what you want about Tree of Heaven, uh, but, you know, these are uh, at least... Uh, some of the most beautiful tree of heaven that I know in the Lower Mainland. Uh, they are now seeding themselves around, and they probably don't deserve to, um, uh, to be retained, but, uh, but anyway, there you go. Uh, it's a beautiful um, uh, sun, uh, even, you know, summer sun on, on the tree of heaven. Uh, you have, if you walk around some of the less sort of arboretum uh, like areas of Riverview, you find interesting surprises. This is a Chinese juniper. Again, it's probably about 60 years old and um, uh, growing, uh, growing well. And, you know, I mean, I could go on and on. I've got lots of pictures of, of um, sort of more obscure plants all over, all over the site, but the diversity of plants on the site is incredible. It's, um, it's in fact, surprising. And, um, uh, you know, whenever I do a tour and whenever I've been on tours of the site, it, it's really just the sort of the arboretum that people are walking around. But there are so many other interesting places on the Riverview site. Uh, and frankly, a lot of that material that's on the site probably deserves to be propagated. Uh, and um, I don't know if we can maybe enter into... Uh, um, uh, an agreement with the uh, city of Coquitlam or maybe with the botanical garden at UBC or something, but there are plants that probably do um, deserve to be propagated and uh, spread around or at least replanted if, they're, uh, if smaller plants are going to be removed. Uh, everybody knows the Chitalpas. Uh, the Chitalpas are... Um, uh, uh, an interesting, you, you know, botanically an interesting group of plants, um, hybrids that were that were first developed in um, Tashkent, in the former Soviet Union, um, and uh, these are summer flowering trees. If you if you only ever come out to the Riverview site in in the autumn to see the autumn color, then you miss the Chitalpas, which are in full bloom in uh, July, uh, and. Uh, looking fantastic there. Uh, so uh, back to those few questions that I asked, uh, why is there a tree collection at Riverview? Well, it's a, um, the legacy of being an arboretum of John Davidson uh, uh, collecting together uh, a huge variety of plants uh, and then uh, going to, uh, on to bigger and better things uh, as it were, uh, as director of UBC Botanical Garden. Um, that's, that's maybe a joke, but um, uh, I'm not sure if it's bigger and better things uh, because uh, I think that the work that he did at Riverview, uh, you know, stands uh, as, a, as a pretty Im impressive feat. Uh, and then secondly, patient health. Uh, we, 
it's been uh, mentioned already today, but you know, we can't say strongly enough that trees and uh, this kind of landscape is a healing landscape. Uh, and I think that that's something that we should not lose sight of. You know, development is very um, necessary in places, but I think that there are also places where we need to be aware that um, there are better uses uh, for land than, um, you know, than houses. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, how old are the trees? Well, I've gone through uh, a few of those, and many, many of the bigger trees are 100 years old or more, more than 100 years. Uh, and there have been additions, uh, sort of every decade you can see there have been additions. And the problem we're having now is that there haven't been very many additions in the last few years. And that, uh, that's a problem. Uh, uh, and I'll get to, to why that's a problem in a second, and that is, um, is this collection unique? Well, uh, yes, in fact, it's unique in that there are a number of trees that are what we would call champions, that is, the biggest or the, the best example of, of that species uh, that we have locally. Um, but any collection any collection of plants declines over time. And we can all see that. It's so obvious when we walk the site now and we see uh, you know, big oaks uh, with branches that, that come down and, um, uh, and some of those silver maples uh, falling apart. And, and that's why we need to continue to plant because without adding to the collection, a collection will slowly Diminish, And what's been happening is not only that the, the collection has been diminishing, but like I mentioned with the meta sequoia, with all of the blackberries around the bottom, that neglect is also uh, contributing to people saying that the collection is not worth what it used to be worth. And that's really a very slippery slope. Once we start going uh, down there, then people uh, can say, you know, it's justified just to remove the remaining whatever, you know, to build, uh, to build these houses or, or whatever it is. And so curation, uh, you know, my job at UBC is uh, as a curator. And what I do is I determine what kind of trees or what kind of plants that we grow in the garden and, uh, and also you know, how to interpret those and um, to understand the value of that and to communicate that to people. And that's something that the, that, that the uh, Riverview Horticulture Center Society has been doing is that they have been the, the curators of this collection uh, and you know volunteers uh, with very, very little power. This group has been um, uh, so instrumental in keeping Riverview from uh, being destroyed. Uh, I, I really take my hat off to all of the, um, to all of those volunteers. Uh, and you know, that vision I think is, is a worthy one. And I think we just need to continue uh, to keep the pressure on uh, politicians, um, some of whom are still here today, uh, and uh, no, and and uh, you know, there's a lot of political support uh, for Riverview for maintaining uh, parts of Riverview, uh, you know, as an arboretum, and I think that we should uh, celebrate those people who support us. Um, as I say, curatorial management. Uh, is also essential to the health of the collection. And I think that, you know, there comes a time when, uh, I don't know whether it's the, you know, the city of Coquitlam or, um, uh, or an independent voice comes up and, um, and makes some decisions about what's going to happen here. 
because uh, there are lots of people who are making decisions about other things, about the mental health aspects and about the, you know, uh, how much housing there's going to be and, um, you know, and how we recognize the Coquitlam First Nation. Um, but we're left with, really, the, the uh, Riverview Horticulture Center Society speaking for the trees. Uh, and so I think uh, we need to support the society uh, and we need to really kind of step it up now. So I, I hope this has been, uh, um, uh, anyway, a, a, a good view of the collection and I, I apologize for the, uh, uh, the screw ups in the beginning, but uh, I think that's all I have for you. Thanks. <laughs> I would just like to say a huge thank you for, to John Post Justice. Thank you for sharing your passion and your extensive um, knowledge of trees in general, and especially the ones on Simicuela and Riverview. Uh, Douglas has come out and done some amazing tree walks, um, so I hope that in next year you'll come out and join us for one of those. Um, and on behalf of uh, the RHCS, we would like to present you with a small gift. Thank you. So again, our sincere thanks.
who have been captivated by the natural beauty of the Riverview lands. We'd also like to extend a special thanks to the Burke Mountain Naturalists for their unwavering support, advocacy and assistance to our HS over the years. Last but definitely not least, we would like to express our gratitude to all the current and past RHCS members and supporters who have maintained the vision of a tree-filled Riverview lands. Presently, we are 260 members strong, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mick. It's always important to, I think, acknowledge all of the work that has gone um, in order to get us to this point. And it's something that sometimes we, we forget about. But when the long term comes, we don't. We remember every single person who had a, a, a role to play in this. It's important, and I think our journey isn't over yet. So thanks, Mick. Thank you. Thank you.